Shortly after the restoration of the Jews in the land of Israel, an incredible enemy will arise to its uttermost north. This enemy will be composed of one great nation which will gather around it a number of allies. It is this northern confederacy that is destined to plunge the world in it, into its final great war which Christ will end upon his return at the Revelation. When I was a teenager watching the end of World War II, facing the continued fear of another war, I wondered then how it would all end. I once heard a radio program with a minister saying that the Bible indicated that the last war of the world would be fought between nations symbolized by an eagle and a bear. That was interesting to me, but he didn't back up his words remarked with any definite proof. Even though I wasn't religious or interested in the Bible, I still spent many hours in bold sessions about this subject with other men who were as irreligious as myself. Little did I realize that at that time how definite the Bible is about who the nations will be that play the major roles in the last drama. This is certainly more revealed than the vague symbols of an eagle and a bear. There are three major prophecies on this northern sphere of political power which are to be found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It is of paramount importance to identify the time to which these prophecies apply, who the leading nation of the Confederacy is and who the Allies are. Then we shall see what this Northern Confederacy will do and how it will end. There are several clues in Ezekiel's prophecy which establish the time to which it applies. First, several times in the prophecy, it is ascribed to the latter days. And the latter days, which have been previously noted, there are definite terms which donate the time that just preceding and including the events, which will be climaxed by the second advent of Jesus Christ. That is, of course, the revelation. Who will come at this time as the reigning Messiah to set up God's promised kingdom known as the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ? Ezekiel 37 and, uh, 36 and 37 speak of the final restoration of the Jews to the land of Palestine, a restoration from which they will never again be shattered abroad. This restoration has two distinctions which show that it couldn't be speaking of the time when the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile. The first distinction is that they are to return from a long worldwide dispersion. The Babylonian dispersion wasn't very long, nor was it worldwide. The second distinction is that this restoration is immediately prior to and connected with the period of the tribulation. This period brings about a great spiritual rebirth of the nation and the return of Jesus the Messiah to rescue them from their enemies. Ezekiel speaks of the physical restoration of the nation when he says that you, O mountains of Israel, will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are soon to come home. 
And again from Ezekiel, for I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Ezekiel then foretells the spiritual regeneration of the people at some point after they are restored as a nation when he says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. The parable of Ezekiel 37 describes the same events in this sequence. First, the spiritual restoration as a nation in this land, and then the spiritual rebirth of the people. Ezekiel explains the prophetic vision, indicating the dry bones as the whole house of Israel, hopelessly shattered throughout the nations of the world. The bones be coming together, and sinews and flesh being put upon them is explained as meaning the regathering of the people into a physical restoration of a national existence in Palestine. Isn't it fascinating how graphic this physical analogy really is? Ezekiel's vision, however, goes beyond the purely physical. It says, but there was no breath nor spirit in them. This indicates that the real spiritual life would come with the rebirth of the people after the restoration. This restoration and spiritual rebirth of the nation is to be the beginning of the everlasting kingdom which the Messiah is promised to bring. Ezekiel says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Study Ezekiel 38 and 39. The most significant part of this chain of events is hereby established. These chapters indicate with certainty that after the physical restoration of a nation, but before the spiritual birth, the great northern enemy will invade Israel. Then God will supernaturally judge the northern invaders, and this is the very act which will imply the Israel people to know and believe in their true Messiah, the Christ Jesus of the Calvary. Zechariah beautifully describes this scene when he quotes God as saying, And I will pour out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of compassion and supplication, so that when they look on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Since the restoration of Israel as a nation in 1948, we have lived in a most significant period of prophetic history. We are living in the times which Israel predicted in chapters 38 and 39. In 1854, a scholar named the Chamberlain summed up the cruise of what has just been said. In commenting on Ezekiel 38, he observed, from all which I should in fear, the coming restoration of Israel will at once be gradual and pacific, as restoration permits, if not assisted and encouraged for protected. 
they will return to occupy the whole land. Both cities and villages, they will be settled there, become prosperous and increasing in wealth before this great confederacy of the northern people will be formed against them. Consider that Chamberlain wrote this over 100 years ago, long before Israel was a nation assisted and encouraged by other countries. For centuries now, long before the current events could have influenced the interpreter's ideas, men have recognized that Ezekiel prophecy about the northern commander referred to Russia. Dr. John Cumming, writing in 1864, said, this king of the north I conceive and I perceive to be Russia. That Russia occupies a place in prophecy in the prophetic word has been admitted by almost all Bible scholars and expositors. Ezekiel, therefore, describes this northern commander as Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince or ruler, or we could say dictator of Rush or Russia, of Mesash and Tubal. This gives the background of this commander and his people. In other words, the prophet gives the family tree of this northern commander so that we can trace the migrations of these tribes to the modern nation that we know now as Russia. Gog is the symbolic name of the nation's leader or dictator, and Magog is his land. He is also the chief prince of the ancient people who were once called Rush, Mesash, and Tubal. In the biblical chapter commonly called the Table of Nations by scholars, these names are mentioned. They are described as the grandsons of Noah through his son Japheth, with the exception of Rush. Magog is the second son of Noah. Tubal is the fifth son of Noah. And Mesash is the sixth son of Noah. You must be all excited about Magog, Mesash, and Tubal. You are probably saying, why in the world do these crusted relics of fiction have to do with Russia? Let me assure you, dear listener, these names are not fiction, but they have turned up in many archaeological discoveries in very early accounts of ancient history. One reason for this is that the families of these forefathers adopted their names as tribal names. The family descended from Magog became known as the tribe of Magog. It is necessary on the next lesson to establish some documentation from ancient history. Some people find this subject a little dull, to say the least. If this is your case, you may wish to skim over the high points. For others, it will prove to be rewarding to check carefully the grounds upon which the historical case is being built. Josephus, a Jewish historian of the 5th century, says that the people of his day, known as the Muscovy and Tidobilus, were founded by Mesash and Tubal. He said, Magog is called the Scythians by the Greeks. He continued by saying that these people live in the northern regions above the Caucasus Mountains. Pliny, 
a noted Russian writer of early Christian times said, taken by the Sathenians, was afterwards called Magog. And this shows that the threaded barbaric people called the Sethenians were identified with their ancient tribal name. A good history book of ancient times traces the Sethenians to be a principal part of the people who make up modern Russia. This scholar went on to say that the Greek name Muski, derived from the Hebrew name Musaj, is the source of the name for the city of Moscow. In discussing Tubal, he said, Tubal is the son of Rapheth, founder of the Tribunities, a people the dwelling on the Black Sea to the west of Moshki. Genesis concludes by saying that these people undoubtedly make up the modern Russian people. There is one more name to consider in this line of evidence. It is in the Hebrew word Rush, translated chief in Ezekiel 38 of the King James and Revised Standard Versions. The word literally means in Hebrew the top or head of something. According to most scholars, this word is used in the sense of a proper name, not as a descriptive noun qualifying the word prince. The German scholar, Dr. Kiel, says, after a carefully grammar analysis, that it should be translated as a proper name, that is, Rush. He says, the Benzatine and the Arabian writers frequently mention a people called Rush, dwelling in the country of Taurus and reckoned among the Scythian tribes. Rush was a designation from the tribes then north of the Taurus Mountains, dwelling in the neighborhood of the Volga. He concluded that in this name, the tribe, we have the first historical trace of the Rush or Russian nation. In the light of the abundant evidence, it is no wonder that men long before Russia rose to its present state of power foresaw its role in history. Bishop Lowell of England was one of these men. He wrote in 1710, Rush or Russia, taken as a proper name in Ezekiel, signifies the inhabitants of Sathenia, from which the modern Russians derived their name. In the 18th and 19th century, such men as Bishop Lowe, Dr. Cumming, and the Reverend Chamberlain Rowe were ridiculed by many of their contemporaries. After all, who have imagined then what we now see in modern Russia, a country founded upon atheism? The final evidence for identifying this northern commander lies in his geographical location from Israel. Ezekiel puts great stress on this by saying three times that this great enemy of Israel would come from their uttermost north. You need only to take a globe to verify this exact geographical fix. There is only one nation to the uttermost north of Israel, and that is the Soviet Union, a communistic country. Thus saith the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in olden times by my servants the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for years that I would bring you Gog against them. 
the answer to this challenging question throws down by God through Ezekiel centuries ago is that rather obvious wouldn't you say General Dion's statement that the next war will not be with the Arabs but with the Russians has a considerably deeper significance does it not just think for a moment how incredible a thing we are considering here how could Ezekiel 2600 years ago have forecast so accurately the rise of Russia to its current military might and its direct and obvious designs upon the Middle East not to mention the fact that it is now an implacable enemy of the new state of Israel. How could men like Chamberlain and Cummings, for that matter, 100 years ago, have so clearly seen the future rise of Russia to its present world-threatening position? The answer is again, it seems to me obvious. Ezekiel once again passes the test of a prophet. He was guided by the Spirit of the living God in the Apostle Peter's final letter written as he faces certain and imminent death. He stated the source of the prophet's wisdom and insight. Peter first states where prophecy did not originate, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own if own interpretation. In other words, the prophets did not dream up their own interpretation of life and history. Then Peter declares where prophecy did originate, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoken by God. When a man knows that he is about to die, he usually gets around to saying the things he considers to be most important. Peter considered the certainty and revelance of the prophetic word to be the most important thing in his life. He even warned that in the latter times, men posing as religious leaders would rise from within the church and deny, even really to the prophet's word. If you pass this around to so many ministers, you'll find how true this prediction has become. Ezekiel partially catalogs the ancient names of the peoples and nations who would be confronted of Russia. In the 38th chapter of Ezekiel, number 5 and number 6, all authorities agree on this who Persia really is today. It is modern Iran. I repeat, it is modern Iran. This is significant because it is being wooed to join the United Arab Republic in its hostility against Israel. The Russians are at this moment seeking to gain footholds in Iran by various overtures of aid in order to amount to, to mount a large-scale invasion predicted by Ezekiel. Russia would need Iran as an ally. Iran's general terrain is also much easier to cross than Turkey's. Transportation, however, will be needed through both countries. Watch the actions of Iran in relation to Russia and the United Arab Republic. We believe that significant things will soon be happening there. Ethiopia is a translation of the Hebrew word Kush. Kush was the first son of Ham, one of the sons of Noah. Moses mentions the land of Cush as originally 
being adjacent to an area near the Tigris and Euphrates River. Cautious translator, Ethiopia, 21 times in the King James Version, which is somewhat misleading. It is certain that the ancient Ethiopians, which is modern Abyssinia today, are made up of the Cushites, but they do not represent all of them according to history. The sobering conclusion is this. Many of the African nations will be united and allied with the Russians in the invasion of Israel. This is in accord. The Russian force is called the King of the North, and the sphere of power which the African Kush, that is, force will be a part of is called the King of the South. One of the most active areas of evangelism for the communist gospel is in Africa. As we see further developments in this area in the future, we realize that it will become converted to communism. Libya is the translation of the original word put. We have the same problem pinpointing these people as with Cush. Put was the third son of Ham. The descendants of Put migrated to the land west of Egypt and became the source of the North African Arab nations, such as Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. The first settlement of Put was called Libya by the ancient historians Josephus and Pliny. Gomer was the eldest son of Japhat. These people make up an extremely important part of the future Russian invasion force. Dr. Young, citing the best of the most recent archaeological finds, says of Gomer and his hordes, they settled on the north of the Black Sea and then spread themselves southward and westward to the extremities of Europe. Genesis speaks of part of Gomer's hordes. The proper name of a region and a nation in northern Asia sprung from the Sumerians who are the ancient people of Gomer. The modern Jews understand it to be Germany and call that country by this Hebrew name. A map of the ancient Roman Empire places them in the area of modern Poland, Czechoslovakia and East Germany to the banks of the Danube River. The modern Jewish Talmud confirms the same geographical picture. The conclusion is that Gomer and his hordes are a part of the vast area of modern Eastern Europe which is totally behind the Iron Curtain. This includes East Germany and the Slavic nations. In Ezekiel 38 and 6, the house of Togomar and all its hordes are specially pointed out as being from the uttermost north. Genesis says that they are a northern nation and country sprung from Gomer, abounding in horses and mules. Some of the sons of Togoma found Armenia, according to their own claim today, Genesis includes. The conclusion is that Togoma is part of the modern southern Russia and is probably the origin of the Cossacks and other people of the eastern part of Russia. It is interesting to know 
that the Cossacks, having always loved horses, and have been recognized as producing the finest army of cavalry in the world, today they are reported to have several divisions of cavalry. It is believed by some military men that cavalry will actually be used in the invasion of the Middle East just as Ezekiel and other prophets literally predicted. During the Korean War, the Red Chinese proved that in rugged mountainous terrain, horses are still the fastest means of moving a large attacking force into battle zones. Isn't it a coincidence that such terrain stands between Russia and the Israelites? Ezekiel indicated that he hasn't given a complete list of allies. Enough is given, however, to make me amazed by the number of people and nations which will be involved. Ezekiel prophetically addresses the Russian ruler, commands him to be prepared, yes, prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and you be a guard and a commander for them. In other words, the Russian ruler is to equip his confederates with arms and to assume command. If you have any doubts about all that has been said in, in, in this lesson, isn't it a bit unnerving to note that almost all of the countries predicted as part of this great army are already armed with weapons created and manufactured in Russia. We, are, we have seen that Russia will arm and equip a vast confederacy. This powerful group of allies will lead an attack and restore Israel. However, Russia and her confederates will be destroyed completely by an act that Israel will acknowledge as being from their God. This act will bring many in Israel to believe in their true Messiah. The attack upon the Russian confederacy and the resulting conflict will escalate into the last war of the world involving all nations. Taken, take it then will happen. Christ will return to prevent the annihilation of all mankind. I have stated a little while ago that all of these northern African nations which today appear to be allied with the Russian Empire, it shall not be that in the Third World War they will continue to be allied with Russia, even though today they are. However, let me explain. Now, Russia is only one of the three world empires uh, that shall rule the world. The Sunrise Empire is number two, and the other, of course, is the revived Roman Empire under the Antichrist in cooperation with the false prophet, that is the Pope of Rome. Because at the, uh, the uh, Vatican today is known in the book of Revelation as the synagogue of Satan. And the Pope itself is known as the false prophet or the third member of the unholy trinity. So there will be a day when the third world war will start, even though that the northern uh, countries will at the beginning have to do with being an ally of uh, the uh, Russian Empire, but when the Antichrist arises, these countries will be taken over by the Roman Empire, 
for every country that is touching the Mediterranean Sea will become a member of the revived uh, Roman Empire. But please do not misunderstand me that when this is actually a reality so that the Antichrist is revealed as the Antichrist, the rapture of the church has already taken place. But there is nothing in the scripture that indicates that the Antichrist shall not appear as a man of war and shall fight great and mighty battles in the reformation of the Roman Empire, but shall not be recognized as the Antichrist until after the church has been raptured. We speak of Arab, and yet it is obvious <coughs> that the real leader in the Arab world is Egypt. However, let us not recognize the underhand of the whole situation that Russia is the leader and the guide and the dictator. Russia is the one who is preparing and planning and guiding the entire Middle East situation for a possible early future war against the Israel nation to do away entirely and completely with the nation of Israel. <clears throat> but we want to understand for sure that this is not possible and God will see to it that it is not possible because the children of Israel are the chosen family of God when God will, under no consideration, permit his family to be utterly destroyed, especially by communism, now or forever. This country is in a strategic spot in the prophetic landscape, which is the reason we should follow the events in the Middle East with great interest. Egypt is located at the southern end of the land bridge, which connects the continents of Europe, Asia, and Africa. The value of this important piece of real estate, which has been established by centuries of fighting, will play an important part in events which we will show on World War III. Conveniently in Egypt, it has an ideal location for its role of leadership in the Arabian world. Egypt has a large population, 150,000 man military establishment, advanced industrialization, and President Nasser's military Arab nationalism makes it the political intellectual and cultural center of the Arab world as well as much of Africa. But what about Nasser? Sure, he's dead right now, we know. He died of a heart attack quite some time ago, but nevertheless, let us refer to the entire circumstances as Nasser. So let me repeat, what about Nasser? He has become the symbol of leadership for both Africa and the Arabian countries. War of liberalization from revolution provides us with insight into the future direction which we can expect of the Arab and African situation. And Nasser views the world as a stage with Egypt as one of the principal actors. This role is three-dimensional, described in Nasser's language in terms of circles. The first of these is the Arab area, with Arab unity as the main plot. Beyond this circle lies Africa, which Nasser envisions as the seat of struggle between white imperialists and the ignatius Negroes for possession of its riches. 
encompassing these two circles is the world of Islam. Although threatened by imperialism, in the past few years, NASA appears to have expanded this conception of the third circle to include all non-Western and underdeveloped Western countries. NASA has not served from his written goal to bring about a kind of Arab socialism. He has repeatedly said that kings, sheiks, sultans, and capitalism must all be all obliterated. This has appealed to the a common Arab who has been oppressed for centuries. Using the gospel of materialism plus the common bond of Arab, race identity, wedded with the Muslim religious ties, Nasser believes that he can unite the Arabs to lead the resurrection of all underprivileged nations into a mighty third world force. He visualizes himself as the one to lead the nations of Africa, black and white, to unity. Somehow the aims, ambitions, and worldly directions of dictators, past and present, never seem to change. There has never been a benevolent dictator. Nasser has fallen into a trap which has ensnared all Arab leaders. It would appear that the only way to remain a popular leader in the Arab world today is to keep the flames of hatred towards the state of Israel fanned to a fever pitch. The one who can make the most elaborate and gory promises of Israel destruction is number one on the hit parade. Whenever an Arab leader senses his popularity waning, he whips up a propaganda program about the need to liberate Palestine, according to Middle East observers. It is believed by most experts on the Middle East that Nasser was trapped into the, into the June 1967 war by playing the game of blind man's bluff. He knew that he could never remain enthroned as the leader of the United Arab Republic if other aggressive Arab leaders railed against Israel in stronger terms. It is reported that he was caught unprepared when you can't quickly comply with his order to remove the UN observers from the buffer zone which separated the Arab and Israelite armies. Once this occurred, he had no alternative but to make good his threats. Israel saw that the clear danger of a large-scale Egyptian mobilization in the Sinai Peninsula and also the threat of not being able to ship through the Gulf of Aqaba, the Israelites also saw the rapid unification of all Arabian nations into a formal force surrounding them on three sides. Israel leaders realized that unless they seized the initiative and attacked it, there would be no hope of survival. What started out to be a bold popularity stunt on Nasser's part, designed to make Israel lose face over the blockade of the Gulf of Aqaba, ended in a fiasco. Rather than be completely humiliated in the eyes of the world, Nasser carried the world to the brink of war. It is this kind of fierce pride and smoldering hatred against Israel that will keep the Middle East a dangerous trouble spot. No Arab leader could hope to remain in power if he were willing to make concessions in negotiating with Israel. In June 1968, the headlines in a news magazine warned, 
no easing of Middle East war danger. The report said that the recent visit of Egypt's President Nasser to the Soviet Union, the country that arms him against Israel, turned attention to an area that never seems far from the explosion point. In December of 1968, the ambassador to the United States from Israel, Rabin, a key strategist in the six-day Arab Israeli War of 1967, said that he could be optimistic about peace in the near future in the Middle East. You Tom said of the Egypt Israelite situation never in the history of the United Nations experience with peacekeeping has there been such complete and sustained disregard for a ceasefire agreed to by the parties. Mr. Tunt went on to say that warfare along the Suez Canal has become so intense he might have to consider withdrawal of United Nations ceasefire observers. At the time this is being uh, preached, Nasser is reported to be in poor health. Whether he continues to lead Egypt or is replaced by some other leader or dead by the time this is completed, the, this clearly predictable course of the Middle East will not be changed. There will continue crisis there and a great involvement of the world's major powers. Current events in the Middle East have prepared the stage for Egypt's last act in the great drama which will climax with the finale. Christ's personal return to birth. We are not attempting to read into today's happenings any event to prove some vague thesis. This is not necessary. All we need to do is to know the scriptures in their proper context and then watch with awe while men and countries, movements and nations fulfilling the roles that God's prophets said they would. Long ago, the prophet Daniel spoke of Egypt as the king of the south. Egypt is identified as this power in chapter 11, where Daniel predicts a long span of history involving warfare between Egypt under the Ptolemy dynasty and Syria under the Seleucid dynasty. In Daniel 11 chapter, Daniel leaps over a long era of time to the events which lead up to the personal visible appearance of Christ as God's righteous conqueror. The phase at the time of the end speaks unmistakably of the beginning of the last great war of history. Daniel gives great detail concerning the battles and movements of troops which will take place at the beginning of this war. Our interest here is the revelation that Egypt will attack the revived state of Israel, which will then be under the control of a false messiah. This man will probably be a Jew who works closely with the world dictator who will come to power in Rome. Notice what Daniel said about this attack on Israel. And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push out and attack him. This immediately triggers another invasion of Israel by Russia, who is here called the king of the north. The movement of Russia and its northern confederacy through the land bridge of the Middle East into Egypt serves as a warning to Egypt. Speaking of the Russian invader, Daniel prophesied, 
he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. <coughs> As we saw, the Hebrew words, Cush, and put, which are translated Ethiopian and Libya, represent the black Africans and black African Arabs, respectfully. Aside from the obvious evidence of a Russian double cross of the Egyptians, this passage also indicates that the black African and the Arab African countries will be involved with Egypt and in line for Russian conquest as well. The statement, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps, indicate one of two things. They will be next in line for conquest or they will submit totally to the Russian will and be uh, assimilated into the Northern Confederacy. This invasion of Kush and Put along with Egypt and their fall together is mentioned more specifically by the prophet Ezekiel. And a sword shall come upon Egypt and the anguish shall be in Ethiopia or Kush when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and her wealth is carried away, that is the oil which is constantly a source of trouble today throughout the entire world, and her foundations are torn down. Ethiopia and Put and Lud and all Arab and Libya and all, all the people of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. This prophecy in the first nine verses of Ezekiel 30 refer to the judgment of Egypt and her allies during the tribulation. The phrases, the day of the Lord, and a time of doom of nations places it in the time just prior to the second coming of the Christ. For you students of the Bible, we must add that the latter part of the chapter looks to the time when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Egypt and her allies, but the greater fulfillment is yet in the, the near future. As you discover more pieces of this stirring prophetic puzzle, the Egyptian plan to unite the Arabs and the black African into a third world force seems to be fulfilling what the prophets have talked about. After reviewing such a bleak picture of the future for Egypt and its allies of nations, it may seem as though God has written them all. The truth of the matter is, however, quite, quite the contrary. Isaiah, the reliable prophet that he is, reveals that one of the purposes for the judgment of Egypt is to drive its people from faith in false messiahs and religion to faith in the one true God, a savior of all mankind. Isaiah warns of a terrible judgment which would fall on Egypt in the last days. He speaks of Egypt's very life source being judged and the waters of the Nile will be dried up and the river will be parched and dry and its canals will become foul and the branches of Egypt's Nile will diminish and dry up. If you think the famous Aswan Dam, which diverts the main channel of the Nile River, will help the Egyptian situation, you are most mistaken. Somehow the headwaters of the Nile will be diverted, and that important river will be a parched piece of real estate. Imagine the terrifying implications of this to an Egyptian. 
Isaiah warns of a powerful dictator who will invade and take them over. I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master and a fierce, merciless king will rule over them. This refers to the Antichrist of Rome who will possess Egypt after Russia is destroyed. All of these things will happen to the Egyptians until many cry out to the true Savior Jesus. Isaiah says, when they shall cry to the Lord because of oppressor, he will send them a Savior and will defend and deliver them. What a great demonstration of God's loving heart. Often men won't see the need of God until he so shakes up the world that they are helpless to cope with life without him. It's only then that they turn to trust in God's provision for their shortcomings. Then they discover that Jesus Christ has so paid the plenty for their sins that God can offer a totally free gift of forgiveness and accept them into his eternal family. As you as you listen to this sermon, you may be you may have uh, reached the point where you realize uh, and recognize your inability to live in a way that would cause God to accept you. If this is the case, you may speak to God right now and accept the gift of Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It is so simple. Ask Christ to come into your life and your heart and make your life pleasing to God by his eternal power. We have found the results to be certain and exciting in our own life. I would like to mention here before we close this sermon and prepare for the lesson number two. Let me emphasize the fact that the coming of the Antichrist will be Assyrian. The Antichrist himself will be none other than the son of perdition. And the son of perdition is Judas Iscariot who betrayed the Christ for when he betrayed the Christ with a, with a kiss and sold him for a mere sum of 30 pieces of silver for $18.75 that he went to his own place he will be reincarnated as the Antichrist for it has to be a Syrian, the little horn that shall come forth out of one of the four horns that appeared upon the ram, and that will be the little horn of Syria. He will be the Antichrist, but shall not be revealed as the Antichrist at the time of his appearance, but he shall go to make war against the nations, and he shall consolidate those nations that are to be reformed back into the Roman Empire. And one of the things that he will do will be to defend the state of Israel as a deceiver uh, through his deception and through his propaganda. Thus the Israelites will say, will accept him as what they believe to be their long-awaited Messiah, but he will be the false Messiah. At this point, uh, the rapture does not necessarily have to take place, but rest assured that before the agreement or the armistice is signed in the city of Jerusalem, According uh, uh, to the scripture, Isaiah 28 chapter and uh, the 15th verse, uh, for the armistice will be signed uh, in the city of Jerusalem 
following the Third World War. But before this actually takes place, the rapture has already taken place. But let us not forget that up until this time there will be a tremendous persecution of the Christian people. But those that shall endure unto the end, the same shall uh, be saved. Let us prepare ourselves and prepare ourselves against that day for the coming of the Lord. Draw it nigh. God bless every one of you.